Okay, I think we have a critical mass of colleagues here from the SPP and also from the journalistic corps. So we will start. Uh, hello, bonjour. Uh, welcome to the midday press briefing. Today is Monday, 3rd April. It's not 1st of April that I'm standing here. I'm replacing Eric, and that's the only announcement we have for you today. There are no other announcements. So I'm happy to open the floor for your questions. Mose, go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you, Peter. I have two questions, uh, perhaps also related to foreign affairs, but more directly to enlargement. Uh, one is about uh, the elections in Bulgaria yesterday. Uh, perhaps it's too early to comment uh, on the outcome. We know that the uh, voter turnout was very low, only, I think, 37 percent. But I would like to ask uh, how that might affect, let's say, the negotiations, accession negotiations between the Commission and uh, North Macedonia, because we have this old issue uh, there's a dispute between North Macedonia and Bulgaria about uh, language and culture and history. I think it was somehow resolved last year, but I'm not sure what has happened since then. So <laughs> if it's been discussed in, in the negotiations or it will be postponed to later on in the process, that's one question. If you can give us an update on that. And the other question is about uh, Ukraine's uh, EU membership uh, application. <laughs> As you know, there was a high-level meeting between the college and the Hungarian government uh, in the beginning of February, uh, and then the issue was discussed. And, and um, at the same time, the Commission published a so-called anal analysis report on the progress uh, made by Ukraine, but that was relating to last year. And uh, President von Leyen promised to give an update or inform uh, Ukraine about any progress when it comes to meeting those uh, priorities uh, uh, maybe this spring. And I wonder if that has been done orally or verbally and if you can, let's say, <laughs> disclose anything of that content to us, uh, to what extent uh, Ukraine has made any progress uh, in uh, compliance with uh, the Aki and so on, despite the ongoing war against Russia. Thank you. Thank you, Mose. Okay. Uh, on the outcome of the Bulgarian elections, we will, of course, not uh, comment. The process is still not finished. We expect the announcement of the final results and then, of course, the formation of the government. The European Commission always works with uh, every government that comes from the democratic elections in the member states. So on this, I mean, uh, we would not go into details, but I have Hannah, Anna with me for uh, the other aspects of your question, both on North Macedonia and on Ukraine. Anna, go ahead. Yes, many thanks for your question, Moses. I think that from our perspective, what's now happening with North Macedonia, as you very well know, is the screening process, which is the first step in the negotiations. Um, this process is, is advancing smoothly. Uh, you know that this is about uh, basically, you know, updating uh, North Macedonia on, you know, where the EU legislation has been updated. And then the second part is, of course, the bilateral screening uh, meetings where uh, it's North Macedonia that's explaining a bit, you know, how they intend to, um, you know, proceed with further alignment. Uh, to, the, uh, to the EU key. And as I said, this process is moving forward swiftly. Uh, we expect more or less that this process would be uh, concluded more or less by fall, uh, approximately. And then, of course, um, the next step um, that we would be expecting is, of course, for uh, North Macedonia to, uh, to, uh, to move forward with the amendment of its constitution as it uh, committed uh, to doing in order to be able to hold um, a second IGC. So that's what I can tell you when it comes to North Macedonia. And as as Peter said, we will not be commenting on the uh, potential or not potential impact of uh, the elections in Bulgaria and the next uh, process of forming elections in Bulgaria for the parallel bilateral track between Bulgaria and North Macedonia. And uh, when it comes to Ukraine, um, um, I think that you will recall that already uh, President von der Leyen, uh, you know, uh, explained that, yes, that we see uh, Ukraine uh, uh, is taking steps to address the uh, seven key priorities that were identified in the Commission's opinion. Um, I think that, as you well know, uh, the next uh, stop will be, of course, um, that the Commission will update on the progress that we see 
uh, as part of the next enlargement package, uh, which is expected uh, to be uh, to be presented in the autumn. Um, and yes, as already the president um, explained in Kiev, um, the Commission will be um, will be uh, uh, doing an oral update. Uh, I do not have more uh, details to give you at this stage on this oral update, uh, but I think, as the president made also clear, of course, the focus will be on the uh, on the um, on the enlargement uh, package, as with the rest of the uh, candidate countries and accession countries. Thank you, Anna. Any other questions on enlargement related issues or neighborhood of the European Union related issues? Okay, Theodora, go ahead. Yes, thank you. It's not exactly about the enlargement, but about Western Balkans. So my first question is uh, that the citizens of Montenegro elected a uh, new president yesterday. What do you expect from uh, Jakub Milatovic? And my second question is, so there are tensions between Kosovo and Serbia connected with uh, car plates, uh, burning cars, arrest, etc. Um, on the other hand, the dialogue should be continued tomorrow. So will the uh, mentioned tensions have some influence on the dialogue? Thank you. Thank you, Teodora. On the first one, on Montenegro, of course, uh, we were following the... Um, elections, the presidential elections in Montenegro very closely. Montenegro is a very important partner and candidate country uh, waiting to join the European Union. But we will react to the final results of the elections in line with the usual practice after the assessment by OEC ODIR, Election Observation Mission, which is expected later this afternoon. But uh, in general, we look forward to work together with the new president and with all stakeholders, all political stakeholders in uh, Montenegro to help Montenegro to stay firmly on the EU accession path, uh, build consensus on the key priorities in delivering on this accession path because they are really important for, for the country to progress towards the European Union. That means focusing first of all and urgently on the rule of law issues, reforms in the area of the rule of law uh, as outlined in the, uh, by the European Commission. And of course the European Union stands ready to support Montenegro and continue assisting Montenegro in moving towards the EU membership because this is something what the overwhelming majority of people in Montenegro want. And in this context, the political stability in the country is the key for continuing on the path towards the European Union. On the second question regarding uh, Kosovo and Serbia, yes, tomorrow we will have a meeting of chief negotiators from both sides in Brussels. And uh, as we said uh, all along, we, we expect both parties to contribute uh, to create and maintain the atmosphere of normalization, reconciliation, and quick implementation of commitments that have been made, especially at the end of uh, February in Brussels and then mid-March in, in Ohrid. And the parties themselves, they have committed uh, to refrain from any actions. Uh, that would have the opposite effect. That means that would be going against this atmosphere, the necessary atmosphere of constructive engagement and reconciliation. So we hope that what we have been witnessing over the last few days, especially in Kosovo and in the north, will not have impact, of course, on the meeting tomorrow. The meeting of chief negotiators tomorrow is important because they are going to discuss, they are going to meet actually for the first time formally since uh, uh, the Ohrid agreement, and they will be working out and discussing the steps needed uh, for implementation of the commitments stemming from this agreement and its annex. More questions on enlargement Western Balkans neighborhood. Okay, no one in the room anymore. I see three hands raised in Interaccio. If this is still on the enlargement or neighborhood, then I will give the floor to Jack, Jack Parok. Uh, no, not an enlargement, sorry. Okay, no problem. We have another hand raised, and that's the one of uh, Augustine. Augustine, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Peter. It is uh, still about Kosovo. I mean, the uh, situation in the north is a bit dramatic, and we are back on the crisis mode uh, because uh, High Representative Borrell said that uh, we are leaving crisis mode and now speaking about implementation. So it seems that the uh, agreement uh, uh, didn't change much uh, on the ground. So if you have in few days uh, over 10 cars being burned, uh, and all of them were burned because they had uh, Kosovo car plates, and you don't have condemnation from uh, the political party that represents the majority of Serbs, neither from Belgrade, you have even the call for uprising of the Serbs in the north. So. 
uh, since ULEX is there, you have people on the ground, you are uh, following closely the situation. Uh, if you have a call for the perpetrators to be brought to justice, uh, then Kosovo police arrest the person. Now it, it's it's a bit unclear what is your message because this is not something uh, that you can speak in principle, but it's a concrete uh, concrete thing going on uh, on the ground. So, uh, what's your message uh, and what is your position on the real uh, attacks on those who decide to change their car plates, which is their right as well? And uh, uh, will, uh, you said last week that. This will be addressed also in tomorrow's meeting because uh, car plates are part of the agreement and uh, should be part of implementation as well. So uh, are they going to be discussed tomorrow in the meeting of the chief negotiators? Thank you. Thank you, Augustine. And of course, I mean, uh, the main aim of, uh, of uh, bringing both parties to the agreement from, from Brussels from end of February and then the annex from mid-March in, in Ohrid was exactly to emerge finally from this crisis mode or crisis solution mode. But again, no crisis will be solved by just, by just agreeing to something. It is about the implementation. And this is why the European Union is so clear and so adamant in in pressing on both sides to start with the implementation in earnest, seriously. And this is what is going to happen tomorrow in Brussels. First steps in implementation are going to be discussed. And this is what the European Union expects. This is what the member states of the European Union expect from both parties. And we've been clear all along, including with our international partners, conveying to, bo to both sides, the only thing you need to do now is to focus on implementation and constructively contributing to maintaining the atmosphere of normalization and reconciliation and not do anything uh, in, uh, um, contrary to this. So this is the message. We need to start the work on implementation with both sides and they have to dedicate their best efforts and energies into, into starting this work because only with implementation this agreement can work and can finally help both sides to emerge from the situation we have seen before. Okay, more questions on enlargement. Okay, I see Alexandra is asking for floor on Ingrazio. Alexandra? Good morning, Peter. Thank you so much for giving me the floor. Uh, we've heard j just bef two questions before about North Macedonia and uh, that it is already in the screening process. And I was wondering, um, Anna told that um, we are expecting this process to be concluded by fall. If the amendments in the constitutions um, are not being made uh, by then, are there any thoughts of uh, decoupling um, the two uh, nominees, I mean, uh, Albania and North Macedonia? Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Many thanks uh, for your uh, question. I mean, it is absolutely not for me to speculate. As you very well know, it's for member states to take forward uh, decisions on enlargement. Uh, but what is uh, very clear is that North Macedonia has committed uh, to uh, reforming uh, the constitution um, uh, in order to um, be able to hold the second IGC. For now, with the two countries, the process is, is that we're now focused on the screening process, which is a very important uh, process. It's the first step, as we've said, in the negotiating uh, uh, in the negotiating uh, process, um, and this is where we are. Thank you. Another question, Mose, you were raising your hands again. Okay, uh, very quick question, uh, because um, about Kosovo and Serbia, uh, about the implementation of the agreement, uh, but as we know, remember, I think, that uh, the agreement was never signed by the two sides. Uh, uh, now, I think two months has passed uh, since they agreed to it. Uh, so how can we expect uh, an agreement which has not been signed by Kosovo and Serbia to be implemented on the ground? Thank you. Thank you, Moze. We tackled this question a uh, number of times already. I mean, it's, uh, it's been one month and a few days since the agreement was uh, reached in Brussels and then two weeks and something since uh, the agreement on the, on the annex was reached by the parties. And any speculation about the signature or the way of adopting it are completely futile because what is important is that both parties agreed to this text. This is a political declaration. This is a clear commitment that was accepted and adopted by both parties through the statement of high representative, the statement which was published uh, 
during the night after the Ohrid talks have been finished. So there is a clear commitment, clear acceptance from both sides that they accept both the agreement and the annex, and they make a political commitment to start implementing it. So any discussions about signature or not are completely futile because what is needed now is to deliver on the commitment made, and the commitment was very clear, they committed to implement. Okay, more questions on enlargement, neighborhood issues while we have Anna on the podium. If not, then we go to other questions. Uh, Nawab, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Peter. I have a question on energy, actually, which is that uh, what is your reaction to the decision made by some OPEC member states uh, to cut oil production till the end of this year. Thank you. Thank you. Tim will answer your question. Thanks, um, Nawab. Um, actually, um, not very much um, that we have to, to say on that matter. I mean, as you know, the, um, the EU has in place now an oil import ban um, through the six sanctions package, um, which indeed reduces um, the volumes of oil available on the market globally. Uh, but we've designed that sanctions package, and we've worked very closely with the G7 on the price cap to ensure um, that markets uh, very much remain stable um, at a global level. Um, globally, the, um, the crude oil price has actually trended downwards uh, since the adoption of those sanctions. So the market has been adjusting to that. Uh, we have no immediate reaction um, to, to the comments over the weekend. Of course, we continue to follow the situation closely, but that's a little bit the context in which we're operating. Thank you. Any more questions on the topic, on energy, on issues in uh, Teams? Remit, I see a few hands in interactio. So, Rose. Sorry, Suniva, Suniva, go ahead. I was meeting the EU US Energy Council ministerial. I saw that Mr. Borrell will speak with Mr. Sorry, can you start again? We didn't catch the start of your question. It's about tomorrow's um, EU US Energy Council. Um, with an intervention by Mr. Blinken and Mr. Borrell. I just wanted to know if you wouldn't mind giving some information about it. Um, sorry if I've missed some kind of um, briefing that may have happened. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Of course, we don't mind giving you more information. Actually, a lot of information has been uh, just published in our daily news. So if you go to daily news, you will find all the information about the upcoming EU-US uh, Energy Council taking place tomorrow and co-chaired on the EU side by High Representative Borrell and Commissioner Simpson. Okay, more questions on energy? Stefano, Stefano Porciolo on Interaction. Yes, thank you very much, Stefano Porciolo. I'm Lex, I hope you can hear me. Um, in, an, in an interview to the Italian television, uh, Commissioner Simpson replied to a question on biofuels. And what I understand is that the Commissioner confirmed that there will be uh, a negotiation with Italy on biofuels. We are talking about, I, I guess, the CO2 standards for car and, and vans. And uh, she also said that the Commission supports both initiatives on biofuels and biofuels producers. So um, can you please explain um, us uh, first if, if the Commission uh, considered biofuel, uh, first if the Commission may consider biofuels as possibly be uh, CO2 neutral and does respect the, the, the mandate of recital 11 of the CO2 standards for cars and vans law. And secondly, following what com the commissioner has said, if there is any possibility that uh, biofuels can power cars that will be registered after 2035. So if yes, are, are you referring to a specific type of biofuel or biofuels in general? Thank you. Thanks, um, Stefano. I, I mean, we've, we've discussed this topic, um, I think, um, at significant length uh, last week, and there's, there's not really too much more that I can say. Just to put the Commissioner's comments in, in a broader framework, I, I haven't 
seen the interview with uh, myself, but I've discussed this with colleagues, and I understand she was talking about the, the broader context of, of biofuels, uh, which, of course, are part of our energy mix, more than she was referring specifically to the issue of um, transport. Um, so, you know, we, as, as you know, we had this, uh, the vote last week, so the 2035 zero emissions target is now in law. Uh, the Commission has committed um, to taking a number of steps to implement one of the recitals, which is uh, about carbon neutral fuels and specifically e-fuels. Uh, I think what we've also done um, is, is to explain um, to you why biofuels is uh, more challenging from a climate perspective um, in terms of being de defined as, as climate neutral. Um, biofuels do have that broader um, footprint in terms of the land use uh, that they create the indirect uh, impact on, on land change, on food, on agriculture, uh, on our carbon sinks. Um, so it's certainly not the, the same technology as e-fuels. Um, we, but we're in a stage now where we're looking at the technical follow-up to this legislation We'll, of course, discuss uh, with all member states, and we will act based on the legal mandate, which is in the regulation. We also will then um, hear the views of the co-legislators uh, on any proposals that we make. So, again, as we said before, this is not something where we're in a position to give you a precise identification now of what fuels may or may not be valid post-2035. Um, the transition is, is going to take some time. We see where the industry is making its investments. We see where most people are putting their bets for zero emissions vehicles, um, but we're also in the process of, of putting together the technical legislation which will allow us to do this and to do it in a technology neutral way. Thank you. Stefano, I see your hand is up. Do you have a follow up? Yeah, sorry, just for clarity. So you're saying that your understanding is that the commissioner's remarks on biofuels were not referred to the CO2 standards for cars and bonds, but in general on biofuel production. Is that correct? Thanks. Yes, my understanding is that the Commissioner didn't say specifically that there will be a role of biofuels in the future implementation of this legislation uh, in, in those words, but she said that biofuels is part of several pieces of energy legislation. And of course, that's something that she looks at very broadly within the context of her portfolio. Thank you. Nous restons avec le sujet de l'énergie. Christian, vous avez des questions Christian Spielmann. Oui, bonjour, bonjour à tous les deux. En fait, je voudrais revenir sur le Conseil UE-USA demain et qui va traiter de l'énergie. Je voudrais savoir si déjà la question qu'a posée mon confrère sur la décision de l'OPEP sera discutée entre le haut représentant et M. Blinken. C'est un sujet de première question. Deuxième question, est-ce que vous allez faire des demandes spécifiques demain en tant qu'Union européenne aux Américains sur les fournitures de LNG américains C'est-à-dire que, en fait, si je me souviens bien, la présidente avait annoncé des accords qui devaient être concrétisés sur des fournitures qui devaient nous permettre de, renfermer, enfin, de renforcer nos stocks et de passer le prochain hiver d'une façon un peu plus confortable. Je voudrais savoir si ça, ça va être discuté et est-ce que vous allez enfin discuter avec les Américains du prix du LNG, parce que euh, certes, euh, l'Union européenne a coupé ses approvisionnements, euh, en, réduit des approvisionnements en gaz euh, de la Russie, mais on les paye très très cher au niveau des, des, des États-Unis. Alors est-ce qu'ils vont nous faire un prix d'ami, un prix d'allié, ou est-ce qu'ils restent au prix du marché On va le payer au prix fort. Merci. Merci Christian. Euh, la réunion des conseils d'énergie sera précédée par une, euh, par une rencontre bilatérale entre le haut représentant et le secrétaire Blinken, où on va discuter le sujet des politiques étrangères premièrement. Et dans le conseil même, l'agenda s'est normalement développé en avant, mais je ne peux pas exclure qu'on va réfléchir euh, aussi sur les euh, derniers développements. Mais sur les autres aspects, je laisse, je laisse Tim à, à élaborer un peu plus si c'est possible, mais normalement, nous ne préjugeons jamais le contenu et l'agenda des de discussions qui, qui, qui sont planifiées pour, dans, dans, le, dans le futur. Donc, je ne suis pas sûr si tu veux ajouter quelque chose. Euh, non, pas, pas grand-chose à ajouter, mais juste pour rappeler, euh, effectivement, Christian on a signé euh, des déclarations conjointes euh, l'année passée avec les États-Unis. Um, sur les, les volumes de, de GNL qu'on qu espère importer um, déjà pour l'année passée, uh, l'année oui, passée et puis jusqu'à 2030. 
Euh, comme vous savez, euh, les États-Unis sont devenus un de nos euh, fournisseurs principaux d'énergie de, de, euh, de GNL l'année passée. On a déjà euh, dépassé les, les chiffres qu'on avait fixés. Euh, on continue à recevoir euh, des volumes euh, plus grands qu'avant. Qu euh, en ce début d'année, on, on attend que, que ça continue. Sur la question des, des prix, euh, il y a deux éléments, euh, je pense qu'il faut euh, garder en, en tête. Euh, déjà, les, les prix ont, ont beaucoup diminué euh, depuis l'été euh, passé. On, a, euh, on est à des, des prix, euh, on est à des, des prix euh, qui sont euh, plus bas qu'avant euh, le début de la, avant l'invasion euh, russe de, de l'Ukraine. Et l'autre chose euh, que je veux souligner, c'est qu'on est en train de, de procéder à des, des achats communs euh, de, de gaz, euh, y compris le, le GNL. Euh, vous savez que, que la, la, la plateforme est en place. On est en train de, 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 mettre, de, de collecter euh, les demandes des, des sociétés euh, européennes pour le gaz. On va mettre cette demande euh, sur le marché. Et j'imagine que les fournisseurs aux États-Unis euh, seront euh, parmi ceux qui, qui vont répondre à cette demande. Thank you very much. I see David might have still a question on energy. David Caretta. Oui, merci. Euh, Tim, je pourrais te demander, vu que je ne suis pas un expert, euh, mais j'essaie d'expliquer les choses euh, à mes lecteurs ou auditeurs, euh, quels sont les secteurs... Euh, pour lesquels les biocarburants font part du portefeuille. Euh, par exemple, les, les, le secteur maritime, les avions. Je me rappelle, je ne sais vraiment pas comment, où orienter moi-même euh, ou mes lecteurs. Merci. Euh, oui, euh, je, peux, je peux te donner des, des éléments et puis je, je vais faire un suite à, aussi en, en bilatéral pour, pour donner plus de, de précision. Euh, mais je peux, je peux te confirmer que oui, le transport, c'est un secteur où il y a une, une partie de, de biofuel, euh, pour l'instant, de, de biocarburant. Euh, c'est couvert par la directive euh, sur les énergies renouvelables. Um, mais il y a plusieurs générations aussi uh, de biocarburants. Il y en a les, les anciens hein, qui avaient un, un, un footprint um, plus, uh, plus large. Avec chaque génération, on est en train de, de réduire uh, l'empreinte uh, carbone. Uh, mais uh, même avec les nouvelles technologies, il n'y a, uh, a pas beaucoup qui vont avoir des, des effets neutres. Um, sur le climat. Mais je suis content, uh, je serai content de, de, de faire le suivi avec vous en, en plus de détails, en consultation avec nos experts aussi. Merci, Tim. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions sur l'énergie? OK. If not, then we can open other topics. Yes, Thomas, please. Thank you. The question on <coughs> Ukrainian grain imports to the EU. Uh, the Commissioner um, Wojciechowski last week uh, declared or said to the Polish mass media that he would support Poland's request to restore tariffs on Ukrainian grain if such request uh, uh, reaches the uh, European Commission. In the view of the letter of five member states' prime ministers last week, which indicates such option, Mm, uh, restoring tariffs uh, to, to, uh, as a way to, to, to address the problem. I would like to ask if, if this uh, Wojciechowski's declaration is still the, the, uh, the position of the, of the European Commission now. Thank you. Thank you, Tomasz. That would be for Miriam, who is replaced by Palash. Indeed. Good afternoon. So I will try to do my best in the uh, absence of my specialist colleague, Miriam. So um, let me just confirm that uh, the letter that you have referred to, we have uh, received it and we will reply in due course. Now, in general, on the, on the subject, what I can say is that um, we, of course, uh, we will, as, as a first step, underline our uh, full solidarity with Ukraine and we will continue to do our utmost to help uh, the Ukrainian um, authorities and people in the, uh, in the current context. Now, when preparing um, the proposal, prolonging the suspension of customs duties on all um, imports from Ukraine. The Commission also um, took into account certain sensitivities on the EU market. 
while our main objective is to support uh, Ukraine, we are aware of the need to ensure that the EU market is not uh, seriously um, impacted. To this end, we have strengthened the safeguard provisions to ensure that it can be uh, deployed in a swift and um, efficient uh, manner. So we put on the table a new proposal for the uh, safeguard um, mechanism, which will be uh, looked at uh, by um, the member states uh, very soon. Now, more broadly on, on customs, um, uh, let me just say that the reintroduction of tariffs would only be considered taking into consideration the EU market as a whole. And, and not just the, um, the regional uh, dimension. Furthermore, the reintroduction of duties would only be for those products that are subject to a suspension uh, under uh, the, the ongoing, under the already agreed uh, deep and com comprehensive free trade um, agreement. So that's uh, what we can say at the moment. Thank you. Follow up, Tomasz. Uh, does the Commission see now the distortion of the market, uh, the, uh, the whole single market uh, of the EU as a result of the, the imports from Ukraine as it comes to the grain? Yes, so I, I think what, what uh, I've been trying to say is that we do recognize that some member states are uh, facing uh, uh, challenges, notably uh, those that are located um, around, around uh, Ukraine. That's why we prepared already uh, a package of uh, proposals which, uh, which uh, are intended to remedy uh, the, the situation. Um, for example, uh, the first package uh, grants 56 million uh, euro to three member states, Bulgaria, Poland, uh, and Romania. We see that there is a need for additional steps. That's where we are looking into preparing a, a second package. Uh, the uh, preparations in this regard are um, ongoing. And as regards the customs, um, as I said um, there, I think the key, the key principle is that um, the EU market as a whole uh, would, would have to be seriously uh, impacted and, and not, uh, um, not a regional dimension uh, simply, but more broadly. So that's where I can Thank you. Another follow-up? If the Commission uh, has received any new request from Poland uh, on the stay date uh, re uh, related to, 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 to the grain and Ukraine uh, request to be, to be, uh, to be green-lighted by, by the Commission. And the second point is a quite detailed one, but I will try uh, an agreement between the Polish government and the Polish farmers, um, which was um, uh, yeah, negotiated or uh, was the subject of the talks last week has one point um, on, on uh, the system of, uh, of some kind of the deposit of or bales being paid by transit or transport operators of, of the grain, the, the, the bales to be paid on the entry point to Poland and to, 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 to be returned to them and the exit point. So the question is if such system would be consistent with the single market with the, with the EU law. Thank you. So on the first point, I think it will be for Ariana, who is replaced by Dan, who will come back to you bilaterally. Uh, the second point, um, I think we would have to look into that in a bilateral fashion too. Thank you. Okay, more questions from this domain on this topic. I see in Interactio that there was um, Oliver's hand up. Oliver, you can go ahead. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I'm a bit puzzled because when the Commission went to Kyiv, in February, President von der Leyen explicitly called the Solidarity Lanes a great success and announced another billion euros, I think, in, in EU funding for that. And that also, and she said, we're going to uh, propose, you know, further duty-free, quota-free uh, import of Ukrainian goods, and that will stay as it is. But her agriculture commissioner disagrees and thinks the duty and quota-free import of Ukrainian grains should be stopped. So who's speaking for the Commission now? Von der Leyen or Wojciechowski? Thank you, Oliver. So, of course, President of the Commission is speaking for the Commission, so do the Commissioners. When uh, President von der Leyen was talking about the importance and the success of the Solidarity Lanes, she was talking about the fact that thanks to the Solidarity Lanes, we enabled, the European Union enabled, uh, a huge amount of Ukrainian uh, agricultural production to get out of Ukraine in a situation when the exports are being blocked by Russia in an illegal way. This is uh, something that uh, already contributed to decrease of the, of the prices in the world market. 
which is already a positive example. And then about all the issues that come along, of course, I mean, the Commission is taking care to try to solve it. I'm not sure if, uh, if uh, Balazs has right now something else to add, but the main aim of the European Union is, of course, to help the Ukraine to get out the blocked grains which are stuck in Ukraine because of the illegal Russian uh, aggression. And, of course, if there are issues coming up along the way, the Commission, of course, is trying to solve this issue. But there is nothing we would, we would add at this stage to the topic. Yes, go ahead for the follow-up. Hi, thank you. How do you measure the success of these solidarity lanes in getting Ukrainian grains to the world markets? Because that was the initial idea. It was only about, it wasn't only about getting Ukrainian grain out of the country, which they can't do through uh, the Black Sea because of Russia's uh, sea blockade. But the idea was also that we're going to prevent food crisis in, especially in Africa and in Asia. And I hear from experts that the solidarity lanes actually not contributing too much or anything at all because the grain simply doesn't arrive in, in Africa or in um, in Asia, that actually goes out through the solidarity lanes. It's a different story for the Black Grain um, Sea Initiative. Thank you. Black, Black Sea Grain Initiative. Thank you, Oliver. It has two aspects, so I, I let Adalbert to, to tackle one. Hi, Oliver. Um, I'm sorry, you're seeing a bit of a ballet of spokespeople, but solidarity lanes and uh, the agricultural market situation and uh, other aspects that you're raising are um, quite cross-cutting issues. On, the, on how we measure the success of the solidarity lanes, um, in fact, there's really a few aspects to, to, to look into. One is, of course, the amount of grain that goes out of Ukraine and the corresponding um, uh, benefits that Ukrainian farmers can, uh, can have, which is really... Um, something that allows them to basically continue functioning uh, as an important, very important part of the Ukrainian economy. There's also another aspect, which is exports of other goods from Ukraine uh, into um, the EU and then the world, uh, the world markets as appropriate. And, of course, there is also another aspect, which is imports of goods into Ukraine, and that concerns uh, issues, uh, goods such as anything that's needed for, to address the humanitarian situation in Ukraine, as well as necessities such as, uh, such as fuel. We've got uh, quite good figures um, on, on our website which show the magnitude of all of these, um, uh, of, of the impacts of the solidarity lanes on all of, these, uh, all of these aspects. Now, when it comes to tracing where grain goes uh, specifically afterwards, uh, that's rather something that, uh, that other colleagues are dealing with uh, than, than myself, and it's also not necessarily a very easy task uh, in itself. But just the magnitude of the movements of goods in both directions um, is, is a clear sign of the success and the necessity of the existence of solidarity lanes. And in this respect also, I think what's very important to underline is that solidarity lanes exist not only because of the action of the EU and the Commission, but also thanks to very, very close cooperation with our member states, uh, including also um, Romania, Poland, and other member states at the, um, at the border. And we are immensely uh, grateful to those member states for, for the excellent collaboration that we have with them on this. Thank you, Albert. And uh, the second aspect I was mentioning, maybe a little bit more political or geopolitical, Oliver, is one doesn't have to forget that this is just an additional measure in order to unlock the, the possibility for Ukraine to export the grains. And then where, regardless where it stays, I mean, it always has an impact on the overall global prices of these commodities. And what the African countries, especially African countries, were suffering under after the start of the illegal Russian aggression connected with the illegal blockage of Ukrainian exports was that the prices went up because of the impossibility of Ukraine to export anything. And uh, the increase, although not so painful, for example, in Europe, even by 1% in African countries had already a damaging effect. So bringing the prices back from the total heights, which there were uh, at the start of the crisis, was also one of the effects of the both solidarity lines, but also Black Sea Grain, uh, Grain Initiative. And maybe just uh, to recall some numbers, so while the Black Sea Grain Initiative uh, enabled the exportation of uh, over 22 uh, me million metric tons of Ukrainian grains and wheat, the solidarity lines enabled the export of more than 25 million metric tons. So this means that the world market has these quantities more. That means the price was going down. So it was not only where the grain go physically, 
but also what is the impact on the world prices. And also, let's not forget that the, European mem the members of the European Union are one of the biggest uh, humanitarian donors. So even if the grain stays in the EU, then it can be used also for humanitarian assistance in the countries that need it most. I see one more question possibly on this issue, Momchil. Momchil, you can... Yes, yes, my question is on this issue. Uh, it's uh, it's about especially about the second package. Um, last week, the Bulgarian farmers who protested against the regulation together with the minister um, demanded to be compensated uh, with the amount of uh, 50 million of euro, taking into account that the first package contains... Uh, Oh, uh, nearly 17 million for them. Um, is it realistic to demand um, 50 million? Thank you, Momchil. So I will ask Balash again to join me on the stage. Hi, Momchil. No, so, uh, I mean, I won't be able to pronounce myself on the second package uh, yet. Uh, as I mentioned, when it comes to the first package, we are talking about 56 million uh, euro for three countries, Bulgaria, Poland and Romania. And the work is ongoing on, on a package of a similar magnitude um, um, at the moment. So um, that's where I have to leave it today. Thank you. Any more questions on agriculture specifically? Momchil, follow up. So, uh, Balash, uh, does it mean that uh, the second package will be the same amount uh, for three countries, 56 million around? That I cannot tell yet because the work is ongoing, so I, I won't be able to <laughs> prejudge the outcome of the ongoing discussion on this. Okay, Dafit, is your question on agriculture, please? Hello. Um yeah, uh, the first the first package of measures is is those countries directly affected, but there are countries uh, that are indirectly affected Daphne, next sorry, to Bulgaria, sorry. for instance. I, I have to interrupt you because we don't see you. So if you could try to switch on your camera, because otherwise, you know the rules. Uh, yeah, I I don't know what's wrong with my camera on my phone. It's not working today. Yeah, so then we will have to deal with it bilaterally. Sorry for this. Okay. Any more questions on agriculture? I don't see, so we can move on. I've seen more questions. Yeah, Finbar was trying right from the start, so we go, we stay on interaction. And Finbar, go ahead. Thanks, Peter. Um, quick question. Sorry if I missed this at the beginning, but it's about the uh, president's trip to China this week. Um, we understand that you'll have a trilateral meeting with Xi Jinping along with President Macron. But do you have any other information about how long she's, she's like her itinerary? Um, how long is she going to be there? Who, who else is she going to be meeting with? Um, aside from what we know about this trilateral with um, with President Macron. Thank you. Thank you, Finbar. The complete and comprehensive program of President's uh, stay in China will be, will be published and made available a little bit later on. I see Jack was asking for the floor. Yeah, probably this is like a good time to come in it's slightly. It's not exactly the same, but it's off the back of that. Um, I know, obviously, the focus is on the China visit, but do you know if um, do we know if von der Leyen is going to go to the Good Friday Agreement um, commemorations in Belfast on the twelfth yet? Um, I know that she might be a bit jet lagged by the time she gets back, but um, do you know if she's going to be there? Because other EU presidents and stuff are. Okay, thank you on this topic, which is a very important topic. I'm asking Dan to join me here and see what he can share with you. No, I'm afraid, Jack, I, I can't confirm anything right now. It's a little bit too early, but of course we can get back to you in due course. As for the organisation of any of the events in Northern Ireland, um, of course I'd ask you to reach out first and foremost to the authorities in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you very much. But since we were on China and uh, related issues, yes, please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, this is, a, I guess, a foreign affairs related question, not quite a China question. I hope that can work. This is Kim McRail. I'm a journalist with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, last week, Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich was arrested in Russia on fabricated espionage accusations. What message do you have for Russia on his address, uh, on, excuse me, on his arrest? 
Thank you. I would here refer you to the tweet by High Representative who tweeted shortly after this incident was uh, made public, and there is nothing that we would state beyond what HRVP said in his tweet. Uh, just to add one quick follow-up, which you, you may not have more to say on, but has the Commission uh, reached out in any way to Russian diplomats or Russian officials on the topic? Well, on this, uh, we understand that uh, the journalist in question is a U.S. citizen, and uh, as always, in case of detention of citizens in other countries, the primarily consular responsibility is on the country of which the, the person in question is a citizen. But of course, the European Commission, European Union, was very vocal to condemn this, uh, this, uh, this incident. And uh, as HRVP stated also in his tweet, I mean, this is something which, which is very concerning, and we urge the Russian authorities to, to deal with the issue in the way that uh, he would be released, because this is just an expression of what Russia is doing, actually, to the journalists, their own, and now they are going, obviously, after the international journalists. So this is not acceptable. The collection of information and the related work is something which is a natural, vital part of uh, work of any journalist. And journalists need to be able to exercise their duties and their jobs without any intimidations and, uh, and the threats from the, from the authorities. Yes, go ahead in the back. Anna, Anna let's wait. The lady behind you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I thought it's Anna. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, sorry. Yes. Um, Leah Hillebrand from Austrian Public Broadcasting. Just on China back again, uh, could you at least tell us right now um, when uh, van der Leyen will meet the president? Do you know that already? Which day? Just which day? Thank you. As I said, uh, we will, we will um, publish the comprehensive and complete program of President's Day in China soon. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is about the pharmaceutical legislation, so it's not foreign affairs. Okay, Shall I wait? Uh, wait, please. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's finish foreign affairs. I think there were colleagues in Interactio also asking for the floor. Mose, hang on, hang on. We will give floor to, to other colleagues. Um, Oliver, I see you have a question also on, on, on Twitter and Ukraine and other stuff, so I will give you floor later. Alexandra, you have a question on foreign affairs. Alexandra Buduri. Alexandra, I see your hand, and you have a chance to ask the question if it's on foreign affairs. If not, because we don't see any activity on your profile, no? Okay, so, ah, okay. No? Do you hear me now? Yes, now we hear you. We still Thank you for you. giving me again the floor. One question about China um, and the unratified China-EU comprehensive agreement on investment. We heard um, the Commission President in her speech on Thursday saying that she will not opt for a renewal of this agreement, which again, uh, as, I, as we all know, it's unratified. Um, is she in any coordination about this new, new, no, new renewal with uh, EU capitals? Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Of course, whenever the European institutions are doing something, they are coordinating with the member states, because in the end we are working with and for the member states. But again, uh, since this visit is about to start, I will not go into speculating on the details how this issue will be tackled or what the president will be doing uh, during her trip in Beijing. Bina, I guess you might have a question also on China or foreign affairs. Yeah, it, uh, can you hear me? We hear you. We don't see uh, you yet. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know how, how to. Uh, no, we still don't see you. Uh, I'll, uh, you can give the floor to another colleague. I'll try my computer. Okay. Great. We will be staying here, so waiting until you sort it out. And in the meantime, we can go to other issues. So maybe to the still foreign affairs, right? No? Okay. Foreign affairs? No? Okay, so let's... Okay, last question. Moze. Yes, uh, there are also many journalists here, so I take the opportunity to ask another question. It's a foreign affairs question, not about China, but about um, applications for NATO membership by Sweden and Finland, which I think is a uh, very important issue. And we know uh, uh, that both Turkey and Hungary have ratified uh, Finland's uh, 
application, uh, but none of them ratified uh, Sweden's for some reason. Okay, we know the reasons uh, why Turkey has not done it yet because of issues concerning anti-terrorism legislation and so on, but uh, why has Hungary not yet done it? That's a question, and I wonder if you have an idea about the reasons, uh, uh, because it seems to, to contradict, I mean, the EU's policy, which is aligned with NATO, uh, let's say, uh, against Russia in its war, and it could damage uh, regional stability uh, in Scandinavia if Sweden is not a member of NATO. Uh, so my question is, uh, what is uh, EU's position on this? Uh, and do you think it might affect uh, these discussions about the release of uh, EU funding to Hungary, which has been suspended for the time being? Thank you. Thank you, Mose. The position of the EU is that NATO is a different, independent, completely different uh, institution and organization than the European Union. So we, of course, are not commenting on processes going on within this organization. We are only convinced and uh, we expect that uh, and we hope that uh, NATO will be able to deal with the issue of its enlargement and proceed with the ratification of the entry of, of uh, also of Sweden. But this is really something for the members uh, of the NATO and not of the European Union. The European's po European position is that everyone will be profiting from it because larger NATO means enlarging the uh, zone and space of stability and security, especially in Europe, since majority of the NATO members are also members of the European Union. But uh, going into the anal analysis of motivation of the countries, why are they mm, voting on, why are they not, this is not really for the EU to speculate on. And now we move on from foreign affairs to pharmaceuticals, finally. Just a short question. Do we have a date yet for the publication of the proposed revised pharmaceutical legislation? Hi. It is always my delight to talk about dates for our upcoming initiatives because, as you know, we have a uh, list of indicative uh, in the indicative planning of the Commission agendas, which we publish and which currently has the pharma pharmaceutical strategy for the 26th of April. Uh, as ever, this list is indicative and subject to change depending on uh, various priorities that, affects the, that affect the Commission's agenda, and we always only confirm finally the agenda of the College uh, after the meeting of uh, the Heads of Cabinet on that week. Follow-up, go ahead. Did you say the 26th of, of April? That is correct. And um, we, we, in fact, have a link to the indicative planning of the Commission agendas uh, in every uh, media advisory on the, um, uh, relating to the midday briefing. So please don't hesitate to look at that. Okay, thank you. Pharmaceuticals or health, health-related issues? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Yoyo. Bonjour, hello. Um, so, Alexandra Mato from the Galician Public Television. Uh, yesterday there was a meeting between the French Secretary of State of Fisheries and Commissioner Sinkevicius, and Monsieur Berville said that uh, France is not going to apply the prohibition of the bottom mobile techniques for 2013, uh, that the action plan of the Commission is just an orientation. So, my question is. Did Commissioner Sinkevicius said that, clarify that to Monsieur Bill? Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, there was a meeting yesterday between um, the Commissioner and French Secretary of State, uh, Hervé Berville, as well as a number of representatives of the um, uh, French fishing sector. And it was a, an opportunity to discuss uh, with uh, the sector and also obviously with the Minister uh, our objectives in, in the action plan uh, that we presented a few a few weeks ago, uh, as well as to dispel some misunderstandings, really have a have a good exchange with the um, uh, with uh, the the different participants. And what uh, what this was um, mainly about is really clarifying uh, that the action plan that we put forward uh, is first of all addresses a number of very very important challenges uh, of the. Um, uh, of the fishery, sec fishery sector, including the degradation of the marine environment, but also generational renewal, uh, the dependence on fossil fuels, which is already impacting the economic viability of the sector, and uh, also the issue of level playing field um, with, 
uh, with third countries when it comes to the fishing sector. And uh, specifically on the issue of bottom fishing, our action plan uh, aims to start a dialogue um, with the national authorities, with regional authorities, and with the fishing sector, uh, in particular over the period of the next 12 months, to chart a roadmap towards 2030 as an objective uh, during which we will find, together with the fishing sector, solutions uh, uh, regarding the um, addressing basically the impacts of uh, bottom fishing on the degradation of the marine environment. So not a, um, uh, not a binding uh, objective at this point, not a piece of legislation that we proposed, but an invitation to dialogue together with all the stakeholders to find solutions. And um, the, the meeting that Commissioner Sienkiewicz has held yesterday was uh, very much part of that, uh, that dialogue. Thank you. Any more questions on fisheries or on health while Adalbert is here, also replacing Stefan? No. So then we give another chance to Bina. Let's see if the camera works. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Benna Chung from Yonhap News Agency of South Korea. Uh, today, a Korean newspaper reported that the EU-Korean summit will be held in Seoul next month, ahead of the G7 summit in Japan. And can you confirm the report? And if I may ask another one, what would be the top agenda during uh, President von der Leyen's visit to Korea? Thanks. Thank you for both questions. I will try to answer in one sentence. Uh, we are making our own announcements, not based on what media write, but uh, when everything is in place and we are ready to announce. So uh, both on the trip by President uh, von der Leyen to South Korea and on the EU-South Korea summit, we will uh, make the announcement when appropriate. So cannot confirm anything that is written currently in the media. Thank you. And now, okay, so this closes the foreign affairs issues and we go to another topic you wanted to ask. I had a question on the on Hololay. I wanted to ask whether in his new position he will keep the part of his salary which is related to his management role as a DG or whether in his new position he will have to accept a pay cut. Thank you. And that would be for Balash. Hello. So, um, uh, regarding the recent um, horizontal transfer of uh, former Director General Hololai to a alternative position as all class advisor, uh, what I can confirm is that there is no change in um, in the basic uh, entitlement in the basic salary. Thank you. Any more questions on HR? Since Balash is here with his usual head, if not, then we go to we go to Oliver. Oliver, question on. Also, exciting issues. <clears throat> yeah, hi. Um, so, um, it's it's actually a twofold question on Twitter's algorithm, which was published, uh, I think, on Friday, and plenty of analysts have gone over it. There's already quite a lot of news reporting about it, and we learn that this algorithm, so the way Twitter ranks tweets and makes them visible to us all, actually downgrades and, and, and ranks downward anything related to Ukraine. So news to Ukraine will not be visible to you or me or anyone uh, as much as tweets about uh, cute kittens or Kim Kardashian's recent diet craze. So my question is twofold. It's, it's a foreign policy slash disinformation question uh, uh, pointed to you, Peter. So if you could briefly put on your foreign policy disinformation um, hat on and tell me what you make of this information. Does it worry you that the European public uh, isn't properly informed on Twitter about what's going on in Ukraine? And also that the Ukrainians, uh, Ukraine's civic society isn't in a position to actually, you know, inform the world about what's going on in the country uh, via Twitter currently. And then the question to Sonia would rather be, I know the DSA is not in force yet, but the DSA has quite a lot to say about algorithms and um you know the ranking of, of 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 tweets and of information then how how great platforms should should go about this would the systematic downgrading of news about a specific country would that still be allowed in the eu 
from September onwards. I'm not talking about downgrading, for example, hate speech or um, violent content and so forth. It's a different matter. Simply having the key phrase Ukraine in a tweet, meaning that your tweet is, is probably not going to be visible to, to most people. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, Sonia is replacing Johannes, who would be uh, tackling this question. So I give floor first to her to explain, and then I will take over. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Oliver, for your question. Indeed, the relevant rules here are the ones that are provided for in the Digital Services Act in the DSA. Currently, the Commission is uh, analyzing the information that was published by the online platforms, especially um, the information on the users of the online platforms operating on the European market, in view of identifying and designated those that will be designated as very large online platforms, who will need to then apply the rules provided in the Digital Services Act. Once uh, those platforms are designated, then four months later, they would need to apply the rules. And uh, the Digital Services Act, as you rightly pointed out, provides for various um, strict uh, obligations to the platforms, and one of them concerns the algorithms. So the provisions applicable to the... Um, algorithms would provide for transparency, especially transparency on uh, the content and uh, the use of algorithms, how those algorithms are used in order to put forward or downgrade, let's say, certain uh, information which is being placed on uh, the online platforms. So the provisions will provide for transparency mainly. Thank you, Sonia. And on, on your, the other part of your question, Oliver, of course, I mean, fortunately, Twitter is not the only information source uh, for people in Ukraine and about Ukraine. And uh, there, is, uh, there is fortunately still plurality of sources both within Ukraine and outside about what is going on. But of course, I mean, the potential of a social platform to be misused when it comes to uh, information sharing or spreading of this information is huge, and that is why we are watching, of course, uh, the behavior on social platforms as well within the framework of our work or our fight against disinformation. This is also one of the reasons why the Commission is engaged in the ongoing dialogue with the, with the platforms providers, with the big tech companies, uh, trying to work uh, with them and uh, make them to subscribe to this code of conduct in order to deliver on their responsibility. So, of course, this is a very important issue for us. It is very important in terms of fighting this information, providing the, the regular information or objective impartial information to people, and we can only encourage the platforms to, to, to step up the work they are doing on this. And we will be, of course, watching and, and following. But as I said, uh, really concerning your specific question, this is not the only information source about what is going on in Ukraine, and this is good because uh, there, is, there is a lot of sources uh, about what is going on in Ukraine, and it's important for the world public also to see what is going on on the, the scale of destruction and the atrocities committed by Russia in it, um, which is, of course, supported by a number of disinformation fact actors, and this is the essence of what we do. We need to expose them, continue exposing them, and, and, and fight the disinformation, and part of this fight it's ongoing effort, it's a very widespread effort, is also engagement with social platforms, including with Twitter. Okay, I don't, I see, okay, Oliver, uh, follow up, possibly? Yes, hi, thank you. Um, Sonia, if I, if I understand you correctly, the DSA would mean that if Twitter, or rather Elon Musk, wants to discriminate against Ukraine, wants to suppress or, as some people today say, cancel news about Ukraine, that would be perfectly fine and legal as long as he's open about it and transparent. So as long as, let's assume he's going to be designated as a very large platform, which very likely he is, and he comes forward and says, this is my list of uh, things that actually I want suppressed on my platform because my house, my rules, if he's public about it, there's, there's nothing the DSA could do against that, or am I wrong? Based, um, thank you, Oliver. Based on the DSA, the provisions that would need to be applicable are transparency provisions. 
So the platforms, when they are designated as very large platforms, would need to be very clear about the way how they are taking, let's say, decisions when they use algorithms and how certain information is uh, put forward to the users of the online platform. So this is uh, what is being uh, uh, provided by the Digital Services Act. Okay, thank you. Uh, David, you have the question on this topic or...? Yes, yes, thank you, Peter. Uh, more or less on this topic, because we have this case on, uh, on, on Twitter algorithm uh, downgrading Ukraine, and then uh, we have another case linked to the owner of Twitter, um, Elon Musk, that uh, have uh, um, restricted the access to Starlink uh, uh, for war operations uh, in Ukraine for the uh, Ukrainian forces. Uh, and I'm wondering if uh, do you think that it's 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 becoming a problem and this uh, attitude by Elon Musk, and um, if uh, in the multiple contacts that uh, the Commission is having with him, uh, especially Commissioner Breton, uh, those issues have been raised. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, on, on the contacts uh, with uh, Elon Musk, I will leave it maybe to Sonia to tackle. But in general, since you mentioned uh, Ukraine and the Skylink, of course, I mean, it is very important, Starlink, it is very important for, for Ukrainians to get any support they can. And this is also uh, one of our objectives in the engagement with the partners, be it state actors or companies like, uh, like the one uh, you just mentioned, to continue to argue, to support and engage uh, in order to provide the Ukrainians whatever they need, whatever support they need, in order to be able to defend themselves. So in this sense, we are engaging with the partners in general, be it the political partners or partners from the business or any other walk of life, because uh, there, is, uh, there is a huge need on the Ukrainian side and the Ukrainians need any support they can. So this is what I can say on, in general. I'm not sure if Sonia wants to add something specific. I'm not aware of any exchange uh, between the Commissioner and Elon Musk on this specific uh, topic. Okay, thank you. Any more questions from the press room? No, I don't see any more questions on Interactio, but no problem because we will be here also tomorrow taking more questions. So thank you very much for participating. Thank you to the interpreters and have a nice afternoon. See you tomorrow. Bye.